It's been over two years since we first met yeah. today's guest. Yeah. And it became clear very quickly that there was so much more than what we were just talking about. <laughs> and we have finally been able to make time to sit and talk. Yeah. I would like you all to please meet Leonard Meek. And by the end of this time, you will be shaking your head and saying, how did it happen that this person is living in our communities? So <laughs> welcome, Leonard. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Nice and, to be <clears throat> oh, it's, oh, it is so wonderful to have you back. Yeah. And people may have remembered you from Pride and Bloom and the Pride Festival in Bethel, which we will eventually talk about. But as I had shared with you before we started taping, there is so much that I want to talk to you about that I'd like to just sort of move chronologically through your life. And you did what? And then you did what else? It <laughs> So let's start with, as you can tell already, I'm a fan. So there we are. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so let's start with, you grew up in Harlem. Yes, I grew up in Harlem in the 60s and 70s. Okay, that was decidedly the time to be there. There was mm -hmm. a lot going on. <clears throat> there really was a lot going on. Um, and I grew up in the heart of Harlem. I grew up you know, on 133rd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue. Look that up because it's something different now. Um, but I knew it as 7th and 8th Avenue. Um, and that's where I began. That's where I, that's where my parents brought me home to, from Harlem Hospital, which was two blocks away, two or three blocks away, to our small apartment with a, nine people, four rooms, nine people. Um, yeah, there were seven kids in the house and uh, two parents in the four-room apartment. One bathroom, by the way. <laughs> okay, okay, that takes a real coordinating and, and learning how to... And it worked, we, you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know, it worked. You know, my mother had this thing of getting the young ones up earlier, getting them ready, getting them out to school, and then the older ones did their thing. So, um, and it worked, you know, it really, really worked. And we were close, we had no... We had no choice but to be close. We slept two to a bed. So, except for the oldest one who slept in the living room on the sofa. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sofa had, is the prize. Yeah, it was the prize. So, yeah, yeah. So, what was it like being a gay man growing up? in well, Harlem. And, and, and I understand from some of our previous conversations, you had an older brother. Yeah, who my was older also brother gay. was gay, who was, when I, I, look, it's interesting. I don't want to say when I came to, when I became aware, because I, be, I knew for a long, long time, um, even at a very young age, that I enjoyed looking at boys and being with boys. Um, but of course, when you're really young, I think you experiment, even at an early, early age, you experiment with having a having saying this is your girlfriend, this having a girlfriend. You know, you 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 know, and people push you in that direction. Um, because that's for them is normal. Um so for me, you know, I really, really understood it more um by the time I was in intermediate school. Um, although I did have a girlfriend, because um, I did, I really did like girls at the same time. Um, and I think a lot of us go, a lot of people go through that, male or female or them or they. I think we all go through liking everything. You know, we're we're young, we're 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 just looking for somebody nice, somebody we like to be around. Um, I was going to say, so I think I think that's the determining factor. It's what is out here? What is it that is available to me? What does that feel? Trying it on, seeing yeah, you know, if it fits, and then um, moving on. Yeah, it's you know it you know you know of course um, I had an older brother who was 
in that day and age, for all intents and purposes, out in the 70s. My mother, my parents knew, the family knew. Um, so I didn't have the coming out thing on my mind. That was never something that that I cared for, that I thought was a part of me. Um, I just figure I'll go my way and you accept me as I am. Um, if I bring home a guy, I bring home a guy. That's just what it is. If I bring home a girl, I bring home a girl. That's just what it is. Don't ask me questions. Just, just enjoy who I'm with, like I do. Um, and I've always felt that way. So I never, had, I don't have a coming out story. That's, that's I don't have that. I was just out. <laughs> who And out to me is be who you are. Um, and it's okay. So, but, you know, being gay and knowing that you are gay and knowing that you're a dancer in Harlem in the 60s and 70s as a male is not the easiest thing to do. And I didn't know this until I effectively really delved into dance. Um, just to give you a little background story, I grew up watching, you know, Fred Astaire, Bojangles, all that on TV, and it never occurred to me that I could be a dancer, ever, ever. Um, until I was in the sixth grade and we had assembly every Friday. And I went to an assembly and my best friend Kenneth and I are running around carrying on, carrying on. And then, you know, we're playing around doing things we shouldn't do because we're supposed to be in school. But it's, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not in class. So we're, we're playing around and carrying on. So we sit in the assembly and the lights go out, you know, all the ooh, 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 ooh. And then they make an announcement that there's going to be some dance. And we're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then these young black dancers from an intermediate school, the lights come up and they hit the stage. And I tell you, that's the very moment I said to myself, that's what I want to do. That's all it was. It was that simple. Um, and then I expressed to my sixth grade teacher, my interest, Mrs. Evans, and she was all for it. And then she told me how she danced on the side. She never said a word until this, we, no one knew. This was like mid-year. No one knew. And then she told me she had a niece in the high school performing arts. Yeah. And so I so she so I said to her, I want to go to that intermediate school where they had that that we just that we saw. She said, Great. So but she introduced us to live theater. Um she took me to, she took the class to see Stephanie Mills and The Wiz on Broadway. <gasps> I had never been to a Broadway anything. I heard about it, but in my mind, Broadway was for the elite, really for white people, for the elite, this, that, and the other. And later on that year, she took us to see Alvin Ailey. So she introduced uh, me to theater and to, you know, all of this. And she really, you know, egged me on. She even brought her niece in to talk to us about dance. And she had us put on our own version of The Wiz, where I, where she said, you're going to be the scarecrow. <laughs> so, so we did that. And it was so much fun. And, but, you know, I still, I just, I just wanted to be one of those kids I had seen in my assembly. So I went to that high, I went to that intermediate school. Okay. Now, how did you get into the intermediate school? Did you need to audition no. or... All you, you just have, applied? Well, it's a public school. So basically, they're looking for you to go to a school closest to your home at that point. That's how things went. You went to a school in your neighborhood. This was literally two blocks, a block away from my home. So both schools were. So I went to that IS 136 is where I went. And the other school was PS 92. And I went to IS 136 and I joined Mrs. Evans, Miss Evans, Miss Evans. Miss Elaine C. Smith's dance program. Miss Evans was my sixth grade teacher. Um, and Miss Elaine C. Smith, I joined her dance program. And for two years, I danced. And once I started dancing, they labeled me the dance boy. I was the only boy who would dance. I was the only boy who even ventured to put on a pair of tights when I had to. Um, I was going to say, thinking of some of the names that we all got called growing got up. Them all. Yeah, I was going to say, Dance Boy. I would have said yes to that one as well. Yeah, <laughs> I said yes to that one. But the others I I had, yeah. so it's the only time I remember having a fight in school. 
because I was in the eighth grade now. Um, believe it or not, e eventually all of that stopped because nothing, I could care less what people called me. I wanted to dance and I loved it. I could care less. So by the time I got into the eighth grade, I had convinced some kids from this, boys from the sixth grade to join the dance program. So three other boys joined the dance program. So they were a year underneath me. So all of the bullying, all of the name calling stopped. And it wasn't bullying, it was more name calling. It all stopped, except for one guy, Mac, who literally hit me and called me a name. And so we fought. And I never fought. And I actually won. Because I had older brothers to fight. <laughs> so I actually, I would say that's the one fight I really had. And I actually won. And from that day on, he protected me. And so the whole thing, so I skidded through the rest of the year, my eighth grade as the dance boy, proud, everybody supported me in and out of school. And that's rare, but that's rare. That's my experience. And that's rare. And I think it's because you couldn't determine. I think most people, you just saw that. At the same time, my brother's lover, Kevin Hunt, was teaching at Bernice Johnson's in Queens, but I was too young to get on the subway. My mom wouldn't allow wow. me to take the subway. So my brother, God rest his soul, he's deceased now. He gave up his, he would come pick me up on Saturday mornings and take me out to Queens. And then he'd come pick me up. But there was, there was a catch 22 to this. After a few months, he said, you know where to go. You know how to get there. Here are your instructions, and you are not to tell mommy that I'm letting you go on your own. He would come and pick me up, take me to the subway, give me two dimes, because phone calls were a dime back then. I would, when I got to Queens, he expected me to be there at a certain time. I had to call him before I started dancing. And then I had to call him before I came home, and he would pick me up and take me back home. And that's how I started. And they gave me a full scholarship because we were poor. And I, when I told my mother I wanted to dance, she said, you can do whatever you, you can dance all you want. I can't afford it. Yeah. I don't have that. I don't have that kind of, I don't have any money. Basically what she said was, I don't have any money, you know? So, and they gave me a scholarship. And so I, I was going to say, so this is the eighth grade. This is the, this is the eighth grade. This is the seventh and eighth grade. Yeah. Okay. And, and. What I'm jumping at here as I interrupted you is, where did you go to high school? I went to, <laughs> yeah, to the High School of Performing Arts, the actual fame school. <laughs> I, I was going to say, we, for those of us who saw fame, you went through the audition process? Absolutely. Absolutely. And was it an accurate portrayal? Yeah, except for... It was over a few days because oh, really? back then you had to go in, you had to take class, you had to take a ballet class, you had to take a modern class, then you had to come back, and then you had to do a short piece. So it was like a three-day thing for, for each student. And um, your, grade, you had to, your grade average had to be 75 or above. Okay, so that's like a C plus kind C plus of or above. Okay. Yep. Um, and your if you went into ninth, if you went into the ninth grade back then, that was probation. You had a year because they they would ask they had, they would ask you to leave if you weren't doing well, and send you to another school in your tenth year. Like change it back then. I was going to say I I have a vague recollection of the original movie version, not the series version of one of the performers in the dance company. They're approaching her, saying, "Okay, you're just not making it." So she so she switched to theater. But there we go. Yeah. Okay. So what was your experience like? Wonderful. <laughs> I was going to say because <laughs> it was okay. Here's the crazy part. Okay, go. They got, they got the heart and soul right of the of the movie. They got it okay. right. The, the feeling yeah. that the movie portrays with young people being artists, they got it right. We, you know, that that high in that high school, we had I had more freedom as a high school student than anybody else I knew. 
it was on us. I mean, there was like at the front door, there was a woman at the, so you go through the front doors, you go up a few, you walk in, you go up a few steps. There was another set of doors, but before those doors was where the stairs to the classroom and the gatekeeper sat behind the second set of doors. So people were sneaking in and out. You could slide in and out and the other. Um, we used to, I mean, it was you, the, the first thing they told you was you're responsible. This, this is your art form. This is what you say you want. We expect you to be responsible to get here and do what you need to do. We are not going to police you to get into this classroom. You want to take dance class, you want to take music, you want to take drama, then you get here on time, ready to go. You know, so consequently, class started at 8.20. Most of us were in the building at 8 o'clock, ready to go. In the dance class, stretching, warming up, talking, laughing, ready to go. Um, you know, and they also said to, said to you, and all of you, anybody who's just starting, like this is your beginning, you're late. Age-wise, you're late. Yeah, so we have to true. do... 10 years of work and 10 to 12 years of work in the next four years to get you ready. So we need, you know, and they put it on you. They put it on us as young students, you know, and we loved it. Oh, okay. I, I, I have a myriad of questions, but I want to start with how competitive did it feel when you were in class or was there more of a supportive, collaborative, you know, you and I are both in the same class. I want to see both of us succeed or I can't, or is it a, I need to do better than you are? More of the second. Okay. More of the, like the, the latter of what you said is, we were, it was more camaraderie than anything else. Okay. Um, of course, the nature of the beast is that, you know, you're, if this person is, doing five turns, you want to try and do six, you know, yeah. but it was very friendly and very like, let me help you. Let me see if I can help you figure out how to do this. You know what I mean? I mean, we grew up that we grew up, you know, um, in there because we were together for four years. I mean, your class, you moved together for four years and we were just supportive of each other. And we really, we, most of us liked each other. Um, and if not, we all got along at least. Um, and when we went across the floor, it was competition. It was competition to dance, just to do your best as a dancer, as an individual dancer. But I also think that it's more about the individual in that respect, because yeah. there were people who were competitive. I never felt, I can remember, I never ever felt like I needed to compete with anybody, because I always believed we were all individual, and we all brought something different to it. And I always thought that. So... Competing with people wasn't me because for me, that meant I spent too much time thinking about what you were doing. I just needed to focus on what I was doing and get better as quickly as I could. And so that's how I looked at it. And I'm going to circle back to a question that I will be asking probably for, you know, each clearly defined parts of your life. Sure. As you were in high school. That's a time when we're learning a great deal about ourselves, our sexual orientation, gender identities, all of that. Yeah. We have this perception that somehow being part of the performing arts, it's easier or it's more accepting. What was your experience like being yes. a gay male dancer of color at the high school for the performing arts. Okay. Yes and no. Okay. okay. Um, what I found interesting being at the high school performing arts as a, as a person of color was that we had no teachers of color. When I was there, we had no teachers of color. I'm, um, I'm stunned, but okay. Nope. No. Not even academically. And we're talking the seven. We're talking the seventies. Not even academically. Um, the people of color were your typical, unfortunately, Shady Sadie. Her name, the lunchroom lady was really named Sadie, just like the movie. Lillian was the guard, was the guard at the school entrance, the janitor. Um, 
And I think around my junior year, Mr. Bland came in. He was a black man. I don't know what he taught. Um, he didn't teach me, but and I, he taught something in the theater, but I don't know which department, but I know he was there. And that was it. Everybody else was white, the entire, the entire teaching staff. My entire teaching staff at performing arts was white. Being, but now being gay in school back in the 70s wasn't like it is now. I you couldn't. But in the dance school I was in, there were a lot of people who were openly gay. So there was this. Now, when I first went to high school, I had a high school sweetheart. She and I also went to the same dance school. And we went to we went to Bernice Johnson's and we went to performing arts. I was in love with her. Unfortunately for her, and fortunately for me, I met a guy who stole my heart. So I had to figure this one out. And eventually that's, I knew that's where I was going. Not eventually, I knew that was the pull, the ultimate pull for me. And I just accepted it and went with it. And I had a glorious four-year relationship with him, you know. Um, he was much older, so we're going to leave that alone. <laughs> uh, and so being gay in the dance world, there is, there's more acceptance now than there ever was, like everywhere else in the world. But back then, there were, you were gay, but you just moved on. You didn't. You had, you had, you, the guys were all gay in a little, we did everything outside of the studio and this, that, and the other, or the, you know, you didn't really do all of that in the, inside that world, although they quietly accept, they quietly accepted you. And I always said, who wants to be accepted? I don't, you know, I don't want to be accepted. I don't, I just want you to leave me alone and just go about your business. Um, you know, and I don't want to be tolerated. Who who in the hell wants to be tolerated? Not I. Um, I think that's offensive. Um, so there's this sort of duality, and I think it still exists in some places in the dance world. Um, there are guys that are and women and them and they that are not completely out, although it's the art world. The art world has some. You know, everybody thinks the art world is not racist. Well, let me put it to you this way. When I was in high school, they steered all the black kids to modern dance. To be, when you got to this, when you were a sophomore, you got to split, you got to choose whether you wanted to be in the ballet world or the modern dance world. They steered all the black kids towards modern dance. And all of them, they even told girls, You'll never be able to dance because of, of, because your body's great, but you have a big butt. You'll never be able to dance. And and it's only been recently that there is finally a prima ballerina who is- Which everybody should stop and say, isn't what's wrong with that? Everybody should stop and say, how long has this been happening? And only now? Exactly. Everybody should stop and say that. Well, what's wrong with the fact that one, one, and there's still one. Are, yeah. There's still, for lack of better terms, the token, you know? So everybody should really stop and think about that, you know? And I, I do all the time. I go, you know, and there's still only one after all this time now. They're still, they, they only see room for one. So High School of the Performing Arts is four years. Yes, it is. So in your senior year, you have to start thinking about, okay, next. I, I exactly, I'm going to graduate. Uh, what happens next? Well, my, my, my thought stream was, I have spent four years dancing every day of my life. I danced pretty much seven days a week for these yeah. years. Because when I wasn't in dance school during the week, two days a week, I was, when I wasn't in high school dancing two days a week, I was in Queens and on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I was in Queens dancing. So I danced, and if I wasn't dancing, I danced with small companies at well, by the end of my sophomore year, I was dancing with like Kinetic Energy and the Mafada Dance Company. I was dancing with small companies. So I was dancing constantly. And my only thought was if I, my real thought, my first and only thought was, I spent all of this time studying to be a dancer. 
wanting to be a professional dancer, trying to be, get a job as a dancer. I want a job after I graduate. I want a job. But the audition, a lot of the auditions took place when you were in class, in school. And my mother was adamant that I couldn't do that. That she did not want me to do that. She wanted me to finish school. She didn't want anything to distract me from that. She said, you have to finish high school if nothing else. Because from there, you can go to college whenever you want and instead of the other. But most of the auditions happen for adults. They happen during the week, dinner, that, or your mother has to, you know, you have to take your parents with you or this, that, and the other. My mother couldn't afford to do that. She didn't have the time. I have a question. Mm -hmm. You're at a school that specializes in the performing arts. They didn't have something built into their curriculum. That's... They did not want, no. They because did... I, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, in, in the fashion design industry, they have student shows where the major fashion, ha fashion houses come in and look at the work that's being produced. They didn't create similar platforms for you? Not, when, not in my time. Um, okay. Not in my time. Uh, I mean, I have friends who cut class to go to the Ailey audition. But if it was found out in school, they got in big trouble. Um, so how did you end up auditioning? Well, in my senior year in high school, Jerry Houlihan, who was a former dancer with Laura, came to high school, came to my high school and she started teaching and she became a member of the staff. And I'll never forget it. It was my 17th birthday because I graduated a year early. It was my 17th birthday and we were in class. And I think that was like a Wednesday. And she said, after class, she said, you know, it was the end because I had, so let me give you a little bit of schedule. When you first start in your ninth, when you're in ninth grade and 10th grade, you have your dance classes in the morning and your academics in the afternoon. And then it flips. You have your academics when you're in 11th and 12th grade, you have your academics in the morning and your dance classes in the afternoon. And that facilitates you being able to stay after school if you're doing some kind of performance and going right into that and practicing and all of that. So after this class, I was in my senior year. So after my afternoon class, my afternoon modern dance class, she pulled me to the side and we were talking. She said, so, you know, you look amazing today. I mean, you always look good. You know, she prefaced it, but you always look good. I was like, yeah, yeah. She said, but today you look good. What's going on with you? I said, well, my birthday. She said, really? She said, happy birthday. You know, all the nonsense. She said, so what are you doing after school? I said, well, you mean after I graduate? She said, yeah. I said, well, I'd like to get into it. I'd like to dance, but I'm going to have to go to college because I don't have anything, I don't, you know, coming up. So I'm just going to go to college. And she said, well, would you, would you go to an audition? I said, sure. She said, okay. So she set it up so that I could go on a Saturday. So, it's one of those kismet moments of exactly. Here is here is the kicker. So I go down to Laura's studio on 18th Street. And you know, that was the loft days. He had a studio in his loft, you know. It's a Saturday afternoon. And I'm thinking it's an audition. So I'm thinking there's going to be a cattle call or it, it was just me. Literally, and I'm warming up. I'm there like 20 minutes early and I'm warming up and I'm waiting for the others to come. And Laura comes out, he introduces himself, he sits. Then almost all of the other dancers are there. I have no idea why the whole company was there. And he says, okay, let's start. You ready? I said, yeah. So I'm looking around. He says, no, it's just you. And I auditioned for about an hour and a half, just me, by myself. Yeah. And I, when we finished, I was like, well, that was fun. You know, and I said, thank you. And he said, well, I want you to come back. I want to see you again. So I said, well, I'm in school. So he held, he got me back on a Saturday again. This time there were nine other men. They were all dancing and we auditioned together. And he said, well, I want to take you into the company. And I was in shock. But I'm the kind of person that I I just kind of, I'm low key when stuff like that happens. 
So I was like, that's great. I'm da, da, da. He said, so can you leave school early? I said, no, I don't think so, but I'll ask. In answer to your previous question, that ties into what you said about them setting up programs and stuff for you. There are things that they do. Like I had to perform at, during my senior year, I had performances at the museums and stuff like that. Um, and then I have a senior project that you have to do. And it's a dance concert that you have to do. It's a full two hour concert that you have to do. Um, and when I asked, if I could get out early, if I could, you know, because I had all my grades and everything was there, if I could, you know, graduate early, the dean of dance said, absolutely not. Even though you had this phenomenal offer from a major dance company. She said, absolutely not. That is not permissible. You have, you have things to fulfill at the end of the year, which in a way was good because it taught me something. It taught me that you have to fulfill whatever you start. I didn't like that at the time, but looking back, I realized, you know, she was sort of right. I need, I made, I'm in school. This is the commitment I've made. I've been rehearsing for this program. I've been rehearsing for the, we started rehearsals for this thing. I'm in all these ballets and all the, I need to, I need to fulfill this. So I said to Laura, I cannot graduate. He said, okay. So I started rehearsing on the weekends with Laura. And on the day I graduated, I did my performances and the other. The next day we had graduating ceremony. I gave my mom and my sister my cap and gown. I took my dance bag and left for rehearsal. <clears throat> that was June 13th. <laughs> now you performed with that company for how many years? At right off the bat five. for five years. And that was a world. You said you wanted to ask about touring? Yes. Ask. <laughs> well, I was gonna say because I remember just doing brief little things within the state of Vermont and the bags and and the rush and that, you know your dressing rooms were not glamorous at si at times it was a closet at the end of the hallway and you know well, the the only your only space was truly when you were on stage and yes. performing yes so. well as luck would have it or whatever you the divine whatever whatever you believe in the divine i call it a divine works for me I graduated in June. In July, I went on tour. The first place I went to was Jacob's Pillow. Of all the places I'm performing in Jacob's Pillow. Never been there before, ever. Barely knew about it, honestly. Um, so I read up about it, said the other side, oh, wow, this has amazing history. So everybody from Alvin to, you know, Martha Graham to Dennis, to, you know, all of them there. I'm like, wow, this is history. Um, I'm I'm part of it. I'm performing here. Like, okay, so so that happens for I think about a week and a half. Come back home. We rehearse all summer. <clears throat> In the middle of this, I learned that I have to go to Europe. Now, what I didn't tell you was I never told Laura I was seventeen. He assumed I was 18. And then when he asked me, finally, I said, yes, this is before I knew. You know, I'm 18 and I kept going. I said, I graduated from high school. You know, I'm 18. I had to go back and tell him that I was 17, which meant I needed a guardian to go to Europe. So the road manager agreed to be my guardian. Um, well, to sign on as my guardian. And they left me alone after that, which was great. So that was in August. Little Lenny from Harlem, who had only been to Port Jervis, Connecticut, because I was a fresh air fun kid, and that's where I went as a fresh air fun kid. Charleston, South Carolina, because that's where my family was. And now, oh, that's not true. And the Berkshires, that's not true. Because when I was at BJ's, when I was, I, I skipped over this, sorry. When I was at the school in Queens, I became part of the junior company. And we actually went to St. Martin's to perform. 
<laughs> when I was at the end of my ninth year of high school. So I had been there. That's the one place I had been. I was now in September. I went on the road for six weeks. Now, nobody's going to believe this, but I had no idea this is what dance meant. I had no idea that dance meant touring and traveling. and Because all I know is I wanted to be on stage performing. That was my real focus. I was that naive. I was that just blank on any ongoing, on traveling and touring and what that meant and this, that, and the other. Um, so I quickly got it together. And I left the tour in September. I stepped off the plane eight and a half hours later, and my foot stepped on Romanian soil. And that entire tour, I was pretty much in awe of where I was. I was in Romania, Portugal, Ireland, East Germany at the time. Yeah. So we went through Checkpoint Charlie to get there, and said the other. Um, Turkey, Istanbul, and I'm, I, I tried to take it all in. <laughs> okay, you're on an international tour. Yeah. How were you received in all of these different countries, all of these different cultures where you're performing? Because some of those have some very rigid classical ballet traditions. You're performing modern dance, which has to be a bit of a challenge to their, their cultural consciousness. When you go onto the website, I want you to look at a piece I have on it called Cavalcade. Yes. Lubavitch. That's the works we were doing. So there was this, and back then they called it contemporary modern dance because there was a heavy thread of ballet through it. So people loved it. They, are you kidding? They loved it. Okay. Um, I love performing that way. Because it was, Laura has this beautiful mixture of ballet and different types of modern Limones, a little bit, a little bit of Graham, a little bit of this, a little, and then it's a little bit of, and it's Lar, and it's a lot of Lar, um, and it's Lar Lubavitch. We, I, I call, I know him as Lar, of course, from working with him, uh, the Lar Lubavitch Dance Company, which is still going. Um, and he just had this way of, using people and patterns and music and making and asking you to move that was just you felt everything you had learned had come full circle and it had you you could use it all okay i i'm going to make a very fast transition here because oh. you you've just started touching into some of the areas that i really wanted to ask about it's your on the street in Manhattan, and somebody might come up and introduce themselves to you, so and that have... might and that might have been, yeah, that was At... Mr. Alvin Ailey, and... and this is the weirdest thing for me. It's really to this day, it sort of takes my breath away, it takes me aback. I had let Lauren know that I was going to be leaving the company in six months. And that was in December. We had come back off this great tour of France. We were in Angers for six weeks where he created the now famous duet, that the male duet from yeah. Concerto 622 and all of that. Um, so, and I came back and I said, it's time to move on, Lenny. You've been here five years. Um, you're now in your twenties, you wanna do something else. I had no idea where I was going, none whatsoever. So I don't know why I was in the area, but this is when Alvin, the, the company was in the theater district. They used to rehearse on the in the Minskoff theater, rehearsal spirit, building. And I was walking across towards, so I must've been going to Ailey for a class or something, I think, because I was walking across Avenue of America, 7th Avenue, and Alvin was coming at me. And I was like, this is Alvin Ailey. And I walked and he came and he walked right up to me. And he started talking to me like Leonard. And I said, 
Mr. Ailey. And I, you know, you don't want to say to him, I didn't want to say, I'm surprised you even know who I am, you know, because I had never met him before, really. Um, and he said, I understand you're leaving Lars' company. Were you, are you, would you be interested in joining my company? And I was like, absolutely. He said, good, I need you to come to the audition. And I went, okay. <laughs> the auditions were coming up in a few months. I hadn't left Lar yet. The audition was coming up in June. It was, this was April. It was a beautiful day in April. The audition, we stayed, he gave me the information. I, we stayed in like loose contact so that I could make it. I went to the audition and he, th I was in. Um, okay. <clears throat> Alvin has this incredible reputation for his creative process, you know, sort of locking himself in a room and just working through things. And then there have been multiple stories about what it was like to be a member of the company and working directly with Alvin. Some people had described it as inspiring, some challenging, some saying it varied when I, I, I want to know what did it feel like to work with Elvin Haley? Well, I'm going to say it in one word fabulous. When you are working with someone like that, of that magnitude in the world that you are in and that you're, you're aspiring to be in and to grow in and to grow up in, and you're in a room with this person, it's all of those things. It's challenging. It can be a little bit daunting. It's extremely exciting. And you can't wait to see what happens. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's you're in front of, for lack of better terms, Alvin Ailey. <clears throat> okay. And then after Alvin Ailey, you were still part of the company with Judith Jamison. I don't know if you know, I don't know if you know, but I resigned. After two years, I resigned from Ailey. Well, no, yes, you told me that, but and then I went I, back to Lar and then okay. for two years, and then I went back to Ailey under Judy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So Judith is formidable in herself. She her very presence commands the stage. Was that a similar experience to working with Alvin? Alvin was yes and no, because understand, understand this, and she may not like me saying this, but she learned that that was her mentor. Right. So she got a lot of that from him. Okay. But Alvin was Alvin was the kind of director that you would see, like we'd be in, I mean, I'm gonna. This is a little the difference between the two, but yes, they are both formidable. Um, Alvin was the kind of director that we'd be in Detroit and we'd be going somewhere. And Alvin would be sitting on this street corner talking to the bums, talking to the what what we consider bums. Right. Bad terminology, Lenny, but bums, you know, what we colloquialisms there. And the thing we love the most is that that night in the theater, they would come up and get their tickets and be sitting in the like fifth row orchestra. There'd be like five or six of them sitting in the orchestra watching Ailey because Alvin gave them pre VIP tickets. That was Alvin. Alvin was out there. He was like, he was like this with people, like you're mixing dough. He was always out there and he would always tell us, talk to people, get out there, get out there. Judy had a slightly more different generational approach. You know, that's, Judy wanted more mystery behind you. Like I remember once, I used to always go, if I wasn't performing or if I only had the first ballet, I would go sit in the audience because I like to learn from my other, from my peers. And she said, you know, you can't do that. You have to be discreet. You have to keep the mystery. And I said, I'm in the back of the theater. I'm squeeze in at the last minute. I need to see what I'm performing. I need, that keeps it fresh for me. That I, when I watch them, I learn how to, I'm hopefully getting better at performing. These are my peers who I admire. I want to get, you know, so that was the sort of, that's the only way I can describe the difference, but they were both, Alvin is a, Alvin was a huge quiet presence. 
he was very like, you know, he, you know, he would say things like, you know, you need to really do that better. And I know you can. So next time, do that better and just move on. And Judy would be, uh, Judy had a different approach, you know? So it was, I mean, but both of them are just um, amazing. They were both amazing to work with and for. And I don't say that just because I say that because they were. Um, when I left the company the first time, it had nothing to do with them, um, either of them, uh, him, I should say, because um, I loved working for him. I loved being in the company. Um, I loved being in the company with Judy, but it was at a certain point, you know, accumulatively, accumulatively I'd been there at 10 years. Um, I was getting older and it was time to move on. And so I left, you know, I just, one day I just said, I'm done. And I'm going to make a really quick transition because I'm being very conscious of time because mm -hmm. I love talking with you about dance, but I also want to talk with you about the other part of your creativity, and that's your writing. Okay. You you wrote your first book, mm -hmm. you know, that the um, little Lenny from Harlem. What, from Harlem, what was the inspiration for that? In between, um, for six months while I was dancing in 1990, I took a break and I went to Paris and Amsterdam. And while I was there, I, for some reason, started just chronicling my life on paper. And what I- Thank you. Um, yeah. And I realized, you know, certain things. And I had done a small version of it. And I've, you know, wrote it for six months and I put it to the side. What I remember, I never ever envisioned myself as a writer of anything. Um, but when I started touring, I never really was a letter writer as a kid. I never had a pen pal back in the pen pal days. I never did any of that. I was, wasn't one to sit and write poems. But while I was touring, I would write letters to my mom and one of my nephews and postcards. And I loved it. And I loved it. Um, and somehow those started evolving into poems that I wrote. And then that started, got me to writing in general. Um, and so when I stopped dancing, I picked up my synopsis of my life and started writing it when I was living in Texas and started rewriting it and flushing it out. Um, and then I put it away again. And then when I moved to Vermont, I wrote it. I just pulled it out and started writing it. Um, it served a purpose. Um, the purpose was, could I do this? Did I like doing this? More than like, was I having fun doing this? And I had fun writing it. And now, so I, I understand that it's not currently available. No. But, but there may be a reason why it's not currently there available. There is a reason. I am going to go back now because I've written more things and hopefully clean it up and make it sharper and better for people to, and easier for people to read. That's so, I, so I have something to look forward to. Yes. And when I do, I will, you will get a copy directly from me. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay. But that's not the only thing you've written. You no. published a novel called Sweet Gum. Yes. Which, which has an unusual premise to it. Could, could you talk to us about Sweet Gum yeah. and how that came into being? Well, Mo Sweet Gum and Ileana, which is my new book. We're going to get to that. Yeah, both came to me while I was asleep. And I I usually have a pad or something like that, and I just jot notes down. Or now I use my cell phone and I jot notes down quickly. And with Sweet Gum, the premise of Sweet Gum is a potential slave master and the slave they fall in love, two men. And I wanted to discuss... homosexuality, homosexual love 
in a time period where no one, everybody pretends like it was it didn't exist in America. Um, and so researching it, it's hard as hell to find any information because nobody's ever written about it. But there were things that slave masters did to make their male slaves subservient. And they did them regularly. So when you do that regularly, I know there's more going on than just you making someone subservient. There's something you like about it. So I wanted to explore how would this work in the heart of like slavery? How would it work? How could they ever find a way to be together? Um, would it be shunned upon? What, what, how would people react? And so the story's built around that. Um, and I'm happy to say that somehow at the end of it, they find a way to be together. I won't give that away in case you haven't read the book. Well, I was going to say, I, I am partway through the book. Mm -hmm. So please, please don't put a spoiler yeah. in there. But one of the things that I truly appreciated about how the story is crafted is you take the time to, de to describe an encounter or relationship between the two and then how it's perceived by the mother of the slave and the implications of if this happens, then this is how my children or I will be protected or how they will be taken away from me. And then from the potential, the future master's parents' perspective of no, 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 no. You have to be the master. This is the role. So I, tr and, and I have not completed it, but mm -hmm. I truly appreciated that you give me more than just a blank narrative. You try to give me the substance behind the narrative. Thank you. Because that's what I was going for. Um, you know, go ahead, please. Well, no, I was going to say, and then moving on to Ileana. Uh -huh. Well, this is... <laughs> I was going to say, that's a story that happens in World War II. World War II. And it's from the perspective of a young girl who grows up a young biracial girl, that's all I'll say, who grows up in the belly of war, who's experiences her teenage years, her early teenage years in the belly of war. Yeah. And and am, am I going to be encountering the, the same type of narrative where there's an experience and then you're, there will be more description of what's behind the, the narrative, the sort of I nuances, so. the cultural yeah. implications. You're, yeah, but it's from a different standpoint because remember, we're in the middle of Nazism at this point. Well, no, exact, no, I get that. Yeah. Yeah, but it's really from, it's really what she, what she's learning. She's learning in all of this, in the middle of all of this craziness around this, a, teen, a young girl, who starts out as this is 12 and leaves and it's over by the time she's 16. Well, a portion of it is over, but she's 16. She learns of loves. Good, abusive, controlling, forced, mutual, gay, straight. She learns. She has no choice but to learn. Familial love. She has no choice. This is she learns this. How she learns that family is more than just your born family. Um, out of need, out of out of need, out of want, out of necessity. Um, she she grows up through this, and this has an effect on her. You know that last for a lifetime. One of the things I say in the book is that I'll give this away. War stop, not end. Oh, I like that. So, um, so this it's something that she has to she she processes for the rest of her life, for most of her life, until she finally faces it, pretty much. 
Yeah. And and Ileana is available now. Is that now. correct? Yeah. And and we will put up your personal and the ooh. That's the cover. My husband does my covers. <laughs> and we thank him for it. Okay, so we will put up your website because as much as possible, we like to ensure that the I, author is the one benefiting by the sale. Yes, go to the website and there's a link and you can go right to where you need to go to get it. Um, I, that's also because there was a glitch with Amazon and they did something weird. And the best way to get to where I need you to get directly to the book is through my website with my link. It takes you right there. It's in eBooks or it's in paperback and it's made to order. So you order it and you get it three to four days later. Now, is Sweet Gum still available? Yes, and Sweet Gum is at a discounted price right now. It's like Sweet Gum has been out for four years. So okay. it's th like they took 71% off and it's 275. You can get the book now and this and the other. So oh my it's available. Now I could access that through your website as well. Yes. yes. Okay. In my website, my you'll see, I have videos on my website and all that. So go in and hopefully you'll go and experience and enjoy and like. <laughs> and the answer is yes, I have. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Our are there more books that may be forthcoming? Absolutely. Okay. I'm already working on the next one. I had I had this period of where um, I just wrote different stories and I put them away. And usually I find that I don't I don't subscribe to a writing style, but I find that what I do is I write these stories. And I get them out and they're like 30 to 40 pages. And then I have to go back and the characters start flushing themselves out and their backgrounds and their histories and how they really intertwine. Um, they start connecting and, and I like that process. Um, that's the fun process to see where those characters take you because I don't know where things are going to end up. I have no idea. I am not one of those people that has a beginning, a middle and an end. Until I get, I know that I need that. I don't know what that, I have no perceived notions of what that's going to look like for anything I write, I realize. Um, and I like that they sort of, they're real to me, you know, for lack of better terms, they're real to me. And they sort of, and it's all fiction, but they're real fiction to me. And if you can say that, and they just sort of come to me and that's the fun part. And that's what I needed to see if I liked. I didn't know if I'd like writing because writing is somewhat solitary. Mm -hmm. And I come from a background of community arts, pretty much, where you're with other people all the time and you're doing this. And, you know, you're, when you're dancing, it's not like you're not in a vacuum. And the truth about writing, though, is that you're also not in a vacuum because at some point you have to come out to seek advice, editing, everything. You have to people, somebody to read it and say, does this make any sense to you? You know, you have to, so you, you can only be in that vacuum, but for so long anyway, and then you have to come out of it, but it's fun. It, it's most of all, for me, it's fun. I always, you know, people, I always think people that doesn't make you happy. I said, happiness is great. Are you having fun being happy? And if you can do that, then you know, life is going to be good for you until you're no longer here, you know, and then I have, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And with that, thank you oh, for for, thank for you. sharing the fun with us. <laughs> I I look forward to the next book. Yeah. And being able to come back and interview or coming back for next year's Pride Festival so we can talk yes. about what you're doing in Bethel. What we're doing. Absolutely. And I'm going to go back on the website and, and watch the dance videos again. Yeah. Um, and, some of them are old, so you know. But you'll see. There's a quartet, and there's me. I'm. You'll. You'll. I think you'll notice who I am. Um, so yes, I did notice who you were. So, <laughs> so thank you. I will.